For the first time in a while, I experienced several days of what so many others go through for years, a regular lack of sleep and nonstop intense work. I felt the difference in my performance pretty quickly, and I could see how I could easily develop an eating disorder from this kind of routine. In a minute, I'll share with you the science of how that can happen and some profound reasons why it pays to have a slightly more balanced approach to your day and life. This is Lucy Gable, a leadership coach, entrepreneur, speaker, author, and professor at the George Washington University School of Medicine. Welcome to my podcast, Leadership, Life, Health, and Happiness. Recently, I went to a three day long, intense weekend online class. The teacher went over and above and gave us so much more time and energy than expected, which was great. But what that meant was class went for 11 hours for the first two days and eight on the last day, which is Sunday. We only got two to three 15 minute breaks each day and the rest of the time was packed with information. I commend my teacher for all the energy he put into giving his students so much value and extra time. 2,000 people attended from around the world, and most of us stayed on the whole time. My own workload, plus the class, forced me to sleep less hours than what's optimal for me, while working twice as hard. And for those few days, I got a glimpse of the life I used to live, and the life that many people are still living when I realized I was experiencing the physiological responses to the situation by the evening of the very first day, I knew there was a podcast to be made here, and I started taking notes. Here's how it went. On the first day, I woke up a couple hours earlier than my biological clock wants to, but I had a few cups of coffee, and I was energized because I was excited about what I was going to learn. It was on Zoom, so I was watching the teacher, taking notes, reading what classmates were saying in the chat, introducing myself to people. And during the short breaks, I was frantically doing homework to get a jump on things and move ahead. By that afternoon, I felt hungrier than usual. I wasn't surprised about this because we know that when we don't get enough sleep, the hormone ghrelin increases. And that's the hormone that makes us feel hungry. This is one way our body and brain work to get the energy they need to function when we haven't gotten enough from sleep or elsewhere. And yes, this happens with just a little bit less sleep than you need. Could be an hour, could be two hours, but it doesn't have to be a whole night of sleep deprivation. As a professor in nutrition and having consulted people in nutrition for many years, I knew immediately what was going on and I did what I recommend to anyone else. I simply fed myself normal meals and snacks when I was hungry and I had a few more carrots and hummus than usual and made sure I was drinking lots of water. By day two, I was not only more hungry, but I had serious specific cravings. I wanted cinnamon buns and I wanted cupcakes. I truly felt like I wasn't getting enough calories, but I was getting the same number of calories as usual. And in fact, I hadn't even worked out the last two days. So my fierce hunger was not from exercise. My brain was really working to get me to eat more. I had the strongest urge to treat myself to something sweet. And I found myself saying in my head, I deserve this. I'm working really hard. I literally had a conversation with that part of my mind as I said, what are you talking about? This is not you. You never say these things. But I still wanted cupcakes. Thankfully, I couldn't find anything around the house that would satisfy my cravings, so normal meals had to suffice again. Other things I noticed on my second day were I wasn't as eager to speak up in front of the class or show my face on Zoom or participate in the chat. Basically, I felt a little more introverted and less interested in being social. I also was not as productive. I was still doing work during the breaks, but not as fast and not as much. And after lunch, I wanted a nap. 
That was only day two. I know that my body would get used to the change of pace if I continued in this way, but these cravings were so intense. I was surprised. And I know that if this was long-term, the continued lack of sleep and mental fatigue would make it really difficult to stave off these cravings. Another thing I noticed was my big joy wasn't present. I don't mean I wasn't happy, but my big joyous energy and enthusiasm wasn't there by the second day. But this also wasn't surprising to me because it takes mental energy to get to that point for me. Most people aren't born naturally, hugely, positively energetic. But most people who are leaders, people who get up and talk in front of others, people who work to motivate and energize others, these people typically conjure up positive energy by working on their mindset daily. They hold their big vision of the positive impact they want to have on the world And they think about how things they're doing that day are going to fit into that picture. Who they're going to talk to. How do they want their meetings to turn out? How do they want to impact the people they meet today? And how that will support their big positive vision for a better future. And they envision all of their activities of the day having great positive outcomes. If you haven't practiced this way of purposefully creating a positive mindset and joy in the morning... I highly recommend it. And just to let you know, it's hard for more people than it is easy. You get better at it, and it becomes easier with practice, but it does take some mental energy to get it going in the morning and keep it up all day. And your mental energy is affected by, you guessed it, how much rest and recovery your brain is getting. By the evening of day two, things took a weird turn and my research went off track. I went out to have dinner that night with my husband, and at about 4.30 in the morning, I woke up with food poisoning. I felt like I was going to die. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't stand up. I basically lied on the floor thinking about my death. And I found myself asking, is this really the way I want to end my life? And I thought, I just spent two whole days online putting everything else aside for this class. Wow, I would not be happy if these were the last two days of my life. Thankfully, I don't work like that on a regular basis. So these last two days were drastically different. But it made me remember times in my past where I did work like this, nonstop, no end in sight. And I would frequently think, if I died tomorrow... Would I feel like I lived to my fullest? And often my answer was no. I'm happy to report the food poisoning wasn't serious enough for me to need to go to the hospital. We found a home remedy that really helped. And I got back in bed in a few hours and I did not wake up early for class the next morning. But in a profoundly strange twist to this weekend, when I finally made it to class that morning, our teacher was just starting to play the jelly bean video on YouTube. You can Google it if you want to hit yourself with a huge reality check. Basically, it provides a great visual using jelly beans to exemplify all the days we have in our lives and how few days we have left once we remove all the time we need just for regular activities of daily living. I'll give you a hint. It's not much. And then someone in class shared that it was the anniversary of her father's passing that day. And that inspired the teacher to talk about his awareness of our finite time on this earth. I started thinking about my podcast and I thought, what am I supposed to say about this? Well, I figured it out and I'll bring it around shortly. But first, let's finish day three. By the afternoon of day three, I couldn't think of words easily. That's typical for me when my brain is tired or hungry. And you know what? No amount of coffee would get me to feeling the mental energy I had three days prior. I was also in a pretty good brain fog by the end of class. And I wasn't surprised about that either. 
On March 16th, the George Washington University Integrative Podcast interviewed Vivek Jain, director of the Center for Sleep Disorders. And he talked about how the glymphatic system clears waste from the brain and spinal cord during sleep. In the short term, when we don't get enough sleep, it negatively affects our ability to remember and memorize. On top of that, we make more mistakes. We're less patient. And you might even have your own additional unique reactions to your lack of brain energy, like my inability to think of words. Jane says, Research is showing a clear relationship between sleep deprivation and buildup of beta amyloid proteins, which contribute to cognitive dysfunction and dementia as we get older. Now, research also shows that it's okay to go through these kinds of highly stressful conditions once in a while, as long as we can bring it back to a healthy baseline and stay there more often than not. Being in a highly stressed environment with no end in sight is where it gets dicey for your health and your life. If you're a leader today, you're probably seeing here that there are many reasons for you to get enough sleep. By the way, do you know what it feels like to perform at your peak? Through my work, I found many people don't. The only way to really know how that feels is if you give yourself the chance to experiment with sleeping at the right times and getting enough of it also eating the right food at the right times, and getting regular exercise, and giving your brain the input that it needs to have the best mindset you can to tackle your day successfully every day. When you can experiment with that and actually keep up those habits for a significant time, you start to feel at the top of your game. You start to feel optimal, and you never want to go back. And if you're leading people in any way, there are also many reasons here to encourage your people to get enough sleep. When you're brave enough to be different for the sake of yourself and others, you'll be on the cutting edge of progress. And mark my words, this is where the world is going. The time has come where people are valuing their health and well being more than ever. The thought of giving up their entire life and their health for a paycheck is more of a turnoff than it's ever been. It's not pervasive, but there are pockets of people who are shunning the idea of wearing their exhaustion and lack of sleep like a badge of honor. Instead, they're bragging about the time off they took and the great ideas and energy they came back to work with. Would you like to live in that kind of culture as a leader? You can create that. As for the end of life theme that got forced into this story, if you think about it, it fits. I spent three long days at the computer without doing much else in life. Even though I managed to fit a nice dinner and a food poisoning into my weekend, it wasn't the same as a day well-rounded and well-lived. I work not to live that way anymore. I remember when I did, looking back at my life the same way I did that morning on the floor, thinking, did I spend my last days well? And my answer was usually, no, not really. That was one of the impetuses that caused me to make a huge sweeping change in my life. I still have eight to 10 hour work days, but they're punctuated with intermittent spurts of healthy activity, a walk a stretch break, a food break, a meeting with someone who enriches my life. And I make it a point to turn off work at a certain time of day and start thinking about other things in life. All of these little time points within the day make up a beautiful day, even when it's long and laborious and work-filled. And every day is the building block of your life. If you want to make changes in your life for the better, like better sleep, better health, better food, better relationships, you can't completely change your life in one day, of course, but you can choose one thing to work on and implement it daily, and you can truly feel the difference that one thing makes. And that's how good habits set in. Once you have that one thing going pretty well, you pick another one to work on. No one is perfect. 
Not one of us have all the right habits going all the time. Don't strive for perfection. Strive for the best you can that day. What can you do today to make your life a little healthier? To get your body and brain to perform the way they were truly made to? And how can you allow the people around you to feel safe enough to take steps towards being healthier themselves? Guaranteed, when you do that, you'll start to look back on your days and see a life well lived. If you like this podcast, click like and subscribe. Let me know what this subject makes you think about and what you want to talk about next. This is Lucy Gable. Talk to you next time. Thank you.